Good evening. My name is Malcolm Clemens Young and welcome to Grace Cathedral Forum Online. Whether in political debates or discussions about immigration around the kitchen table, many Americans, regardless of party affiliation, will say proudly that we are a nation of immigrants. But are we living in a land of opportunity founded and built by immigrants? Or does this narrative of progress mask and diminish the United States history of settler colonialism, genocide, white supremacy, slavery, and structural inequality, all of which we are still grappling with today. My guest tonight is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, an historian and the highly acclaimed author of An Indigenous People's History of the United States, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, and most recently, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. As we continue our exploration of the cathedral's theme of healing this year, we're going to be talking tonight about how embracing the more complex and honest history of the United States can lead to real healing. Roxanne, thank you so much for joining me. I didn't tell you this before you we were talking uh, ahead of time, but um, this is one of the most important books I've read in a very long time. I, I think it's like one of those lifetime books, you know, where you kind of um, look at a certain stage of your life and, and, and there's a kind of book that kind of brings you back to that. That's definitely the way that I felt about your book. Um, I was saying earlier that I was just reminded just my own ignorance in so many areas. Um, and it was such an engaging um, account. I, I think perhaps one of the most important things for me in the book, didn't you didn't even get to it until page 50, but you're talk, talking about it all the way through. And that is the difference between what an immigrant is and a settler colonial. So an immigrant is somebody who arrives in a new land and um, has to adopt the cultural mores and the, and the institutional structures and the ways of interacting and ways of socializing that is part of the dominant culture. And that's very different than a, a settler colonial person who basically makes up his own rules um, and, uh, and, and establishes all those things for himself, even if that means um, you know, oppressing the people who are originally there. Um, immigrants into a settler culture too, but that's a kind of a problematic relationship too, is that as you immigrate to a settler colonial culture, you have to decide just how much you're going to go along with that program. And, and just that idea was so helpful. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how that idea began to occur to you, how, how you became kind of conscious of that, of that, of that idea. Yeah, well, I wasn't always. Uh, I grew up in a rural Oklahoma, uh, definitely settler, the segregation then, a white town. And um, <clears throat> there were um, immigrants there uh, from Germany and Poland, but I realized later they were immigrants from the 19th century, Yeah, but they were still considered immigrants. You know, they no longer spoke. Exactly. How long do you have to be here before you're not an immigrant? <laughs> exactly. And, uh, later, I said, wow, I was, we were still calling them immigrants. <laughs> we, we were from old settlers, you know, Scots-Irish and yeah. you know, been here forever. So that was, you know, I, I it, it was quite a while before that dawned on me. But, you know, when I was doing my graduate work, well, I did my undergraduate, my, an MA, and then PhD in history. I kind of avoided US history because um, I did, I think it was a reflex that everything that's been written is not right, but I have no idea yeah. really uh, what it is, but it's boring. You know, US history right, is right, exactly. boring. <laughs> so I decided to do borderlands, which was, you know, Latin America, the border, uh, Mexico, U.S. border, and um, got more into U.S. imperialism. This was my first um, step, you know, in, um, <clears throat> because you're doing Latin American history in a U.S. university, uh, you call it U.S. imperialism. Right, right, I did, right. because of the border, I had to take a um, a seminar, graduate seminar in US history, just to, um, you know, because it was a border, it was in, now in the United States. Um, and my dissertation went up to the present at that time. And uh, I, 
I kept hearing these students and they're talking about manifest destiny, manifest destiny. And I, why are they saying manifest destiny? I said, you know, that means imperialism, don't you? And the professor turned and said, you, you, are you a communist? No. Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, what does that have to do? Completely. <laughs> completely. I, made, I made a B in that. It was just practice. <laughs> anyway, you can graduate school. Uh, anyway, that, that kind of woke me up that something really wrong with the study. But it was actually the, um, you know, the it was the 60s. This was the mid 60s. And then it got to be the late 60s. And it was the civil rights movement. And um, I was a teaching assistant for the first uh, Black history class. I learned, you know, a great deal from Ron Tukaki, who was the professor. Oh, yeah. And um, I learned, I got interested in ethnic studies, his idea of, uh, Takaki's idea of ethnic studies yes, actually, you know, started the first um, uh, ethnic studies, black studies. He got fired at UCLA where I was because yeah. of his, he was so popular and he yeah. let uh, black citizens who weren't students come to his class. But he went up to UC Berkeley and, you know, set up ethnic studies there. And then I got interested in, I got uh, involved in um, legal work as an expert witness on the Wounded Knee Trials. Oh, right. Uh, after the 1973. So I got educated by Native Americans, particularly Vine Deloria Jr., who became a mentor, yeah. a Native uh, lawyer and theologian. Episcopal theologian, right, right, and uh, um, and then many others, you know, the American Indian movement, and then I got involved in their international work, and did that, you know, for 20, uh, well, 30, 40 years, um, while I was teaching and everything, and also taught. I decided instead of teaching in a history department, I would help build ethnic studies. So yeah. I taught uh, ethnic studies and Native studies. So that's really, um, you know, really how I, I myself, uh, I, I myself was on a learning path. Now all this knowledge is available and out there, yeah. and people don't have great excuses <laughs> for being ignorant. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. What is it? But um, I'm, I'm always humble about it because I didn't know. Yeah. That, Especially with older people who, you know, didn't go through the '60s, and 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 it, there's so much you can learn during a mass movement that would take years of study to learn. Yeah. yeah. Just orally, you know, the oral uh, exchanges you learn from people, and we don't have many opportunities for that now. Yeah, we don't. And, and I, I, but I, that's why I think it's so powerful. It's just like this idea of a nation of immigrants, it, 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 like. The, the way that that's a, a that that's a problem to re, to regard the United States project in that way, because it really does hide um, hide the 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 fighting and the the cruelty and the uh, re relocate forced relocations. There's a way in which it, it kind of sanitizes American history, and and I think yeah. that's the point of your book, and it it's a it's a really important point that we just we should never lose sight of. And I, I, I love, you know, your first chapter is on Hamilton, um, the musical, which I just thought was, I've been kind of waiting for somebody to write something like that. Um, I, and I wonder just, you know, uh, your argument basically is that um, Hamilton um, basically obscures these, the, these colonial agenda of the founding fathers of the United States. So it, it kind of hides the fact that um, they, many of them were Indian killers too, and were, were dispossessing people from their lands. And that the, the, the the idea too that the that the Revolutionary War was connected to um, Great Britain's refusal to allow the colonies to expand, and colonists wanted to expand, and at, at the expense of the Indian tribes. So, I, I, I wonder if you've heard back from anybody in from from Hamilton, from Lin Manuel Miranda, or anybody about your your your, your critique. No, I haven't. Um, uh, you know, it was is really interesting. I. I had been um, 
arguing against the nation of immigrants for a long time back in the, I, I wrote an essay for monthly review in um, 2005. Uh, they caught, well, it wasn't an essay, it was a, a blog that they yeah, did. Right. And I call, I call it really a rant. What I wrote was a rant. It was like, stop calling this a nation of immigrants. Yeah. But, but my sole argument and irritation was about how it, how it covers up settler colonialism. Yeah. Say, we're all immigrants. And, um, and then I found, you know, um, uh, its source, which I didn't know how recent it was. I thought that people had always thought that or said that. Right, right. It was 1958 and John yes. F. Kennedy. I know it was amazing for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing for me too, because I was, you know, mouthing off as non nation of immigrants and putting it in books and articles I wrote without knowing that until I started research, you know, yeah. when I was uh, started writing this book. Uh, but Alexander Hamilton happened uh, in uh, 2015, was when it was. Uh, it, a Broadway musical, and then it exploded. And it was, of course, I, I had to go see it in order to write about it. And I, of course, the music, you know, the music and, and dancing and all is, is fine. But what people really loved um, was the message. You know, it was, it was the personification of Nation of Immigrants. Right, message. right. And it was like this great um, sigh of relief. Now we know who we are because we were confused by all these, you know, all of these uh, uh, tensions. And we're all a nation of immigrants. And this enthusiasm, and I thought it was, it was very sad that a colonized, a person from a colony, when Manuel Miranda from Puerto Rico, called himself an immigrant. Yeah, yeah. He, he's from a colony, he's colonized. Right, right. He's not an immigrant. Yeah, he's and your point, immigrant. Alexander Hamilton was certainly not an immigrant. He was That's coming it. from one British colony as a British subject to another British colony. And, and yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that's what I mean. It's just so obvious. And yet, um, and yet that false consciousness is such a part of, of, you know, who we are. It reinforced, you know, it was, um, well, this is what, you know, that, that musical was also, you know, it premiered in the White House. It was yeah. associated with uh, Obama and, you know, uh, Black man could be president. Look where that got us, where we yeah. are now. Uh, I mean, it, the ideology didn't work out too well. Yeah. So, yeah, Alexander Hamilton was, uh, he's also portrayed as a, um, you know, as heroic, the Constitution is portrayed as heroic. And um, I think has become, you know, a kind of, uh, idealized and I think telling the truth about him, how he established the fiscal military state, the capitalist state made for war. You know, it, what was totally left out of that musical or anything about Alexander Hamilton in all of the biographies, which were all hagiographies. Yeah, yeah. Is that he was a military man. Right. He right. was a killer, he was the head. Um, he's the one that brought the uh, 30,000 troops yeah, to, to put rebellion. down the Whiskey Rebellion, yeah. a settler rebellion. They didn't, they didn't want to be taxed. They just fought a revolution to <laughs> in, in taxation. And here, you know, the, uh, uh, the New Republic comes and taxes their whiskey. And, yeah, um, and your point is the room where it happens are plans for, for displacing um, human beings and for yeah. for even that idea of the settler the um, of the fiscal of the fiscal military state. I mean, just that was very helpful for me too. I mean, I, um, I, I, I just think that um, it, it's almost hard for me to imagine what capitalism would be like without without that settler colonialism. It's like it's almost hard to imagine. I mean, it's just like they're not. It's hard to just. To, to disentangle the two threads, you know? Yeah, it well, capitalism 
spread. Also, if you um, see in the United States, all the studies that have been made on the cotton kingdom in the last uh, decade, yeah. uh, where you, know, you, you have to place the um, industrial capitalism as having originated far earlier than in the past, you know, the Northeast uh, factories and all. In the cotton kingdom, um, the and based on slave labor, yeah. that in fact are the the first proletariat were enslaved Africans, right? In the United States, so we never had a proper trade union movement. That that period of trade unionism, they were practically all I would say ninety nine percent immigrants, Italian, Southern European. Uh, Eastern European immigrants born somewhere else and immigrant labor that they brought in, you know, millions and millions. And um, so even our, our analysis that we do of why, why don't we have a powerful labor movement? You know, why don't we have um, at least attempts at workers, you know, workers' rights? No, you know, capitalism, is is ingrained with settler colonialism in the United States. Yeah, I mean, you quote W.E.B. Du Bois just basically saying, talking about how, I mean, it seems like such a contemporary comment that um, African-American and um, white um, uh, laborers have everything in common, everything in common, the same goals, same aims, and yet that I, perception of racial difference is what makes it impossible for them to unify and to, and to yeah. organize. Yeah, and to admit, admit that slave insurrections were were workers um, workers' yeah. strikes. That definitely woke me up when you said that. I was just like, I just never thought of it in that way. But of course, yeah, yeah. it's about labor. There are labor actions. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it, it had an effect. I mean, it ended. It, that's it. It ended slavery. Insurrections made it impossible for slavery to continue. So it was no goodwill of, you know, Lincoln or whatever. They could yeah. see the writing on the wall that this was going to be um, maybe even a nation in the South, like Haiti. Yeah, right. And those are those are so played down when I took, um, it was Takaki that first made me aware of, of slave inter- insurrections because the, the theory was back then is it was such a tight capitalist system, Eugene Genovese, that yeah. there were no revolts. And that's just a lie. There was yeah, yeah. constant insurrection. Yeah, yeah. So, Which is why it, 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 um, the slavers had such harsh measures. But that Thomas Piketty book on capital, I don't know if you read that, but um, his projections in terms of just like what the the national wealth was like so much a massive part of it wasn't factories, wasn't farms. It was, it was human beings, um, right. you know, which is a shocking, shocking thing. Uh, so back to Lin-Manuel Miranda, if you had to do a, a, like a play, like a, or a, a, a musical on, 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 on um, Broadway, like what would you suggest for like the next project for them um, for, for, for a story that you might think would be, a good story to know about that would 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 you know maybe open people's eyes up to some of these things. Well, you know there was a play uh, back in the nineteen late nineteen sixties called Indians, ah. and it opened on Broadway. It didn't stay very long, but I happened to see it. A um, I was living in uh, Cambridge at the time, and I got invited to a preview before it went on Broadway. Yeah, at the Brattle Theater? Um, it was a very, no, not a big theater. It was only about 10 people. It was oh, very wow. exclusive. Yeah. And yeah. a friend took me. I mean, there's no way I would have been invited otherwise, you know, <laughs> someone dragged me along. Yeah. Who, who knew that. So he, he just wanted to get, get a little bit of feedback, you know, and. Um, yeah, yeah, completely. And I was just blown away by that play. And. It was made into a movie called um, uh, 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 now I can't think of the name of the movie, um, but it wasn't a very good movie. You know, yeah, it, was, yeah. it took the story. 
But I really think if that building on that kind of play where Native people have agency, yeah. it, was a, it was a Sitting Bull story where Sitting Bull was, uh, you know, he was imprisoned. And then he, uh, and, uh, the, um, the West, Wild West show was able to get him right. to, uh, and they promised, he was, he was a prisoner, but they allowed him to travel with the Wild West show yeah. and play himself. And so wow. what it has in, in the play, and in the movie, it's very good. Will Sampson played the uh, uh, played Sitting Bull. Is he speaking in his own language, and he's saying all these things that the translator is telling people? And huge crowds. This is a true story. Huge crowds of very poor, barefoot children and poor people, ragged white people. Yeah started coming and gathering around. And he would say, you know, I understand why your government hates me because I'm their enemy. But yeah. why do they hate you? Right. And he was organizing them. <laughs> so they killed, they took him out, uh, you know, then they, yeah. they assassinated him. Yeah. So that was, I think if that could be done again you know that it would be as a musical it would work very well yeah yeah oh i love that i love that i'm so glad i asked you that because we kind of moved on from the 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 um, hamilton conversation but i just didn't i i didn't want to miss the answer to that question <laughs> you know um we we one of the things i love about your book is that you point out that so many immigrants are war immigrants they're basically immigrants who are forced to immigrate because of some action that American military took overseas. So in Korea, in Guatemala, and Vietnam, all around the world. Um, and I, I, I was thinking about you so much as I was reading this, because um, so much was unfolding with regard to the end of the war in Afghanistan. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just how that's connected to your thesis and just, you know, what did you notice in the press coverage over the last month uh, about the things that are unfolding there indian country yeah you know, that's what they uh the term they use for um uh for war zone u.s right. war zone indian country every u.s war is an indian war yeah possibly world war one world war two which were not u.s wars they got involved but they weren't in charge um so every other war, uh, oh, and the Civil War, which is domestic, every other war, and most of them get left out, were constant wars against Native people, yeah. uh, plus the invasion of Mexico, which I, uh, taking half of it, which I consider a, an Indian war in, you know, right. in, yeah. in the, in the counterinsurgency. It always goes to counterinsurgency, not engaging the armed enemy, which native people were, they were armed, they were fighting, they had soldiers. They would go, the US Army would go to the camps where old people, children, and were, you know, and, and to villages and burn the crops, burn the homes, uh, kill civilians. Yeah. So that's what US calls wars, Indian wars, but actually they were, they were genocidal, um, counterinsurgency uh, bloodbaths. Um, just even during the Civil War, which is always left out of the period of the Civil War, you wouldn't know that the largest single massacre took place during that time, 324 yeah. Shoshones killed by yeah. the US, by the Union Army. Yeah. The Navajos on their march, the long walk, were forced by the US Army. They commissioned Kit Carson as an army colonel to carry it out, that mercenary Indian killer, uh, to be during the whole Civil War, 
in a concentration camp where half of them died. And then the Dakota, so-called Dakota War, where the Dakota um, people uh, did attack the settlers that were coming in and taking, they were village people, they were farmers, simply taking over the Scandinavian immigrants who were given, you know, brought, recruited and brought by the US government, given some tools and here they're in the middle of other people's territory. And the US Lincoln's Union Army went in and um, drove them out. And it was the largest hanging, mass hanging in US history yeah. of, of whoever they rounded up could catch. Everyone else, you know, they ethnically cleansed. All of that just during the four year civil war. Yeah. And it's never, you know, the connections never made, you know, that. The Confederates were also in the West killing Indians and trying right, to right. them. Well, that, I mean, it's, it's so it's so shocking to think that this this horrifying civil war they, they, it, it was you couldn't even interrupt the the wars that were on the native peoples to to fight another war. No. It's like both yeah. wars are happening simultaneously. They didn't miss the beat. Yeah, they just yeah. continued and then went all out afterwards. It became the Army of the West, and one connection that people don't usually make that is so important is that why did reconstruction fail? Because they took the army out. Why yes. did they take yeah. the army out? To put them in the West. Right, right. Six of the seven divisions of the US military, yeah. the army was transferred to the West. And so that's how we got Jim Crow. Yeah, that was such a powerful section. Like we were saying before we went on air, that that um, the, 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 it was a huge moment in American history, and it yeah. was deeply influenced by that imperialist impulse. Um, yeah, um, one of the things I, I, I thought a lot about is just you know you point out um, that the whole history of immigration laws you know, basically began they they started in 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 basically in basic racism. Um, so you're talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, and so it's almost like the foundation of all of our immigration system is kind of built on that foundation of racism. I mean, like, how is it possible to reform such a system? And and what ideas do you have for for making it a like a more humane a more humane thing? Well, you know, every administration is the same. There's bipartisanship on yeah. um, exclusion and contingency, making it miserable and difficult to migrate or immigrate to the United States. Um, and it did start with exclusion of, of um, Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act, 1884, the first immigration law was exclusion. And the second was uh, to extend that to all Asians, uh, like three fourths of humanity was excluded. Yeah. But that didn't mean they didn't come. The manufacture of undocumented immigrants is intentional because they're contingent. They can be deported. Right. They have to work without papers, without um, without any benefits, without um, uh, any kind of security or trade unions. Um, so that's intentional. And making it for the Chinese, they're building the railroad at the same time that they're excluded. Right, right, exactly. The, the capitalists are recruiting Chinese men, not their families, the men, to work, and of course, by then, and I go through this whole thing in the Yellow Peril chapter, they had started with Marco Polo, you know, deciding that China had to be destroyed or controlled because it it just was too organized and productive, you know, and they could never compete with it. So they, you know, there was uh, Europe set out, and the United States when it became a uh, uh, independent state joined in yeah. this and, and ended up imposing uh, opium 
the opium trade, opium wars, lots of addiction, China. They had made a basket case out of what had been one of the most uh, vibrant orderly societies. Trading, orderly trading, yeah. not interested in expanding, simply trading. Yeah. And so they were in that condition that people were starving. That's yeah. why they were coming, you know, going in different places, going to Latin America, anywhere to be able to send funds back to their families. And so this was, you know, this double thing of, uh, of contingency and the immigrant being uh, constantly on alert. Like I said, always an immigrant. Yeah, yeah. So, I love what you see. You quoted Leland Stanford just like saying these just outrageously racist things when he's governor of California yeah. about how important it is to exclude the Chinese. And then when he's like the robber baron, like setting up the nation's railroad right. system, he's he's hiring them all. And you know, saying what good workers they are. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, it was it, that that was um, that was such a horrifying section to to think about how the United States um, you know destabilizes foreign countries, even ones that you may not think as being on the on the regular list. Well, this comes up to the present, and you know, possible nuclear war on the horizon surrounding China with uh, gunboats, uh, like the nineteenth century. It's very, very scary because there's still, you know, this was the whole thing about Afghanistan. Let's get out so we can go to China. You know, oh, right. I mean, you're right um, back to that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were talking, even during that chaotic uh, evacuation, they're talking about, well, China's going to newscasters. China's going to take advantage of this. It's on the border. You know, they're going to take right. advantage. You know, <laughs> I doubt that that's the first thing on their mind that they want to. Right. Take. Well, even just that, I, I, I mean, instead of being kind of repentant and just saying, you know, maybe this idea of a military involvement in other countries is, is a, is a terrible thing. Instead of that, like that kind of reflection, you're right. It's just like all the fear-based thing of just like, well, who's who's who are we in danger from? That, that was another thing you just mentioned. You just only put it like a sentence or two in it, but that sense of uh, almost um, kind of compulsion, like a paranoia about um, being not safe from other countries when when we had this massive military and and uh, and and this this feeling of it, we're still never safe and we'll never be safe and and just like that idea of controlling other people as an excuse for not feeling safe yourself. Was was that was a really powerful section in the book too? Yeah, there's this uh, built-in paranoia into U.S. nationalism that everyone wants to take over the United States. I know when I was growing up, it was you know the Cold War, and the maps in you know grade school, they had a map of the world. You know, one of those kind of flat maps that kind of skew things. Yes. And they had the Soviet Union bigger than it actually is, but it was red and it was dripping blood. Oh, yeah. Down into the United yeah. States. Yeah. It was terrifying. I mean, yeah. you yeah. know, it, it scared kids. <laughs> and of course, we were having bomb, uh, you know, right. bomb the, uh, raids. Shelter, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, to get in the cellar. Right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So it, it, it's really. Um, you know, there is this paranoia that uh, Hofstetter wrote about, you know, the paranoid mind. I don't think he really got to it because he never really understood settler colonialism. Yeah. And also the wars, because they ignore these, you know, this constant warfare, that's how the U.S. Army was built. You know, even by the Civil War, they had already had since 1607 building up, you know, wars to fight Native people. Yeah. And so they fought that counterinsurgency against the South, the Civil War. They used all the same techniques yeah. on the South that they had used in the war, three wars against the Seminole Nation in Florida and against Mexico. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's... it's built in. It's a very militaristic state. And, you know, there's this great pride in separation of 
of uh, right, the military, church, the, the independence of the military. The civilians and the mil- yeah, you're right. That's another element, but it kind of it, it hides a, a deeper truth. Yeah, we don't think of the United States as, as uh, uh, militaristic, but that's really problematic because it's it's uh, yeah, it's you know the. I can't, it's hard to imagine the United States without war. And until yeah. we can understand that, you know, I, I personally think maybe I'm idealistic, but, you know, I come from a very poor tenant farmer family. It's not, yeah. you know, it's a learning process. I know I've been able to learn that and, and confront these things that until we do, we can't possibly figure out how to change like the immigration. Right, right. It will go on and on just like right. it is, just miserable at the border. And people who come really believe the, the rhetoric of the United States, that not only is a nation of immigrants, but right. it's a country of liberty and open arms. Yeah, well, the, just the dream of the, the American dream. The, the American the, dream. Yeah. And of course they're fleeing often fleeing uh, violence, but fleeing poverty. Yeah. Uh, but they also think, you know, this is the first place they think of to come because it's supposedly this very welcoming place. Yeah. You, you know, one of the things I've just been dying to ask you about, because I think you you understand this better than anybody else I can think of, but just, uh, um, just back to that militarism in the militaristic society. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just, just like guns and gun culture oh. and how how that the kind of the politics of our contemporary gun culture is connected to that settler, settler colonialism. Yeah, you know, I wrote that book, Loaded. Uh, I know, I want to read it now. I'm, I, I, I'm going to check it out of the library. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's a disarming history of the second. I, yeah, I thought you that was a great subtitle, too. <laughs> <laughs> it was the editor's uh, creation. I, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, it's... It, again, it's something I've always known, and the editor, uh, City Lights, asked asked me to write it. And I, said, I, I mean, I that I wrote that book faster than any book I've ever written, just because I've been saying that all I had to do was write down what I've been saying. Yeah. That you know, you can't separate the militarism from the civilian uh, gun nuts. Yeah. That this is you know, and also profiles. A profile of who are who are the multiple gun owners. Right, right. You know, an average of eight, uh, eight arm. You know, those who own guns own an average of eight. Wow, I just that's amazing. But only one third of the population owns even one gun. Yeah. So you start reducing this and then profiling. And you get a vast majority of white men. And then you look into some of them. I, I, I got a lot of names from the insurrection, you know, January 6th, that I started right, right. researching almost all descendants of original settlers. Interesting. That's so, so we, you know, uh, it it comes down to that. That's that's where the gun culture is is still in those people who are living the the excitement of killing Indians, you know, and taking land and being um, being settlers, you know. Yeah. Um, it spreads, I mean, it, it, people in the last year, I don't know if you know that gun sales practically doubled because for one, they were considered e- e- essential businesses. Oh, that was, I still don't understand that. I, I was <laughs> blown away by that. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh my gosh. And yeah. Essential business. Uh, but yeah, they, you know, they, they couldn't keep enough stock and I mean, enough guns in stock to, um, uh, to keep up with the demand. Uh, but it's, it's grown far, far worse. I haven't even done the new statistics, but the ones are old in my book, you know, because it's much, much worse than that now. 
it all, all makes me too wonder just about just the gun lobby and gun manufacturers and arms manufacturers. And that was another thing that you talked a lot about is just the the kind of thinking of the police p- p- uh, police departments as being kind of a having a hereditary relation to the slave patrols and then and then you know the 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 use of military equipments in in police in regular police forces um that 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 was you know it wasn't something that was new but it, um it was it was very helpful for for me to to see that through line well you know in um something i didn't figure out and loaded that I did when I started doing uh, the chapter on Irish uh, immigration. Uh, The first, the famine refugees were the first. These were the first, you can't really call them immigrants because they were desperate refugees. But in fact, most, uh, most people we call immigrants to the United States are refugees from mostly U.S. wars. Yeah. In the case of the Irish, it was the U.S. Uh, British colonization and starvation, the potato famine, of course, which was induced uh, intentionally. Yeah. They really wanted to ethnically cleanse Ireland, get people out so they could settle it, you know, settler colonialism and Ulster. So that, you know, that uh, took a century to, to bring about this, this crisis. But how the the Irish were the first immigrants that had to be, I mean, they they did have the advantage of being fair, being white uh, and speaking English, Uh, unlike the future, you know, Italians and Eastern Europeans, uh, Catholic and Jewish and, and spoke different languages, didn't know English. So they had those advantages but they came at a time, just at a time when city police forces were, and of course slave patrols were really ramping up. They had already always existed since the 1680s, but they were really ramping up as planta- in the cotton kingdom and uh, with you know even more insurrections. And so the Irish were recruited, and also in the military, the Irish were recruited. This was the way they were Americanized into police forces, hmm. into the military, into slave patrols. So today, you know, it's almost a cult, an Irish cult, police forces. They had the Emerald Society, secret societies, the police unions are largely controlled by uh, Irish um, Catholics, you know, not the Scots Irish are another problem. You know, that, that, they're the settlers, but um, but the Irish Catholic uh, descendants of of immigrants, and of course, more more immigrants came. But the large largest number that reproduced came in that crucial time, and of course, they were they were pressed into the war against Mexico. Yeah. 648 and then into the Civil War. So, but that, you know, that seasoning, what I call the seasoning of immigrants that then produce, you know, certain things. They, and then the Italians, you know, their seasoning was to give them Columbus as a right, a, right. an ancestor. That was one Paris. of the things I wanted to ask you too. It's just, I mean, here we have Columbus Day coming up. I mean, I, and I just wondered just... Like, um, what kind of suggestions do you have just for like an alternative? Because you, you, I, I, what I loved about your story really quickly about Columbus was you, you basically took somebody and you kind of made them whiter <laughs> and made them more of a representative of just all Americans and made them as a kind of like a representative of certain immigrant groups who came. Um, so it, it's like a myth of Columbus that was assembled, you know, since Italians first, well, even before Italians start, first started, but g- gathered steam when Italian Americans, um, Italians immigrated to America. But like, how, how, how might we just be more intentional about having like a, a, a like a, a day that replaces um, Columbus Day, maybe some other day, time of year in the calendar, but I, I, um, but but honors the, the 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 nations that were here in the United States before um, Europeans um, arrived. Well, there is there has been a big movement for many years. Um, Native Americans, I would say, it dates back at least to um, the early '60s of uh, the Red Power movement 
to demanding an end to Columbus Day. Yeah. As a colonizer, a genocider, uh, the onset of colonial, celebrating the onset of colonialism in yeah. the world, not just in in uh right you're totally uh, right i mean a, a new era of exploiting people far away okay. for yeah and and a, a symbol of that and here you are celebrating this symbol so it's been replaced by indigenous peoples Day. yeah exactly I, but I think there are eight, 18 states now of the uh -huh. united states including conservative ones like south dakota but they have, you know, a large population right, of people exactly. who do not celebrate Columbus. They celebrate yeah. Indigenous Peoples Day on that date. And lots of cities, even, I don't know, dozens and dozens of cities and towns, counties, universities. So a mass movement is really going on to face. Now, the problem is that this was created for Italian Oh, Roxanne, you're covering up your microphone. There, um, there you go. They are, um, it was definitely a gift, you know, to, to um, assimilate uh, Italians, Americanize them. It was made a federal holiday uh, by Franklin Roosevelt. Right. But it was the founding of the Knights of Columbus in 1872, in 1882 that began, I mean, it was the Knights of Columbus who were Irish. Right. The founders were Irish, not Italian, because there weren't in really, the Italians hadn't come in great They hadn't arrived yet, exactly. They hadn't arrived yet. But there, there was the Knights of Columbus for when they did arrive to Americanize them through Columbus, because that had already been done. Uh, that was already in you know, in action with the Catholic Church trying to domesticate itself as an American church and be accepted. Remember, this was a Protestant, a Anglo Protestant country. Yeah. Hated Catholics. Right, I grew up right. Southern Baptist, and we were taught there that the Catholics were devils. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, they said that from the yeah. pulpit, uh, the Antichrist. So, it, I mean, that was more recently, you know, I, I think it probably still goes on, although the Catholic Church has Americanized itself. Look at our Supreme Court. Right, completely. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great but, but that, that was a lot of work. And then uh, 1892 came along the 400 year anniversary. Right. So the Knights got really busy. And by then there were Italians coming in. And they had the white city in Chicago celebrating Columbus. But one thing that surprised me in my research is I had no idea how far back the Columbus affinity went yes. and the colony. 1726 is the first time I could find that a town was named Columbus uh. in, in, um, in South Carolina. And then more and more, there are hundreds of them, Columbia and Columbus, right. the District of Columbus. They actually, right, right. the founding, the founders actually debated what maybe naming what became the United States, Columbia. Wow. But instead they called the site District of Columbia and named it the United States. Yeah. And so it really, it really goes deep in the colonial mythology of the United States. So when it, you know, then, then was, it was all in place for these Italians who are coming. They're really Sicilians and from Southern Europe, very dark people. Yeah, yeah. Very discriminated against. They yeah. were treated horribly by unions, by fellow workers. They wouldn't hire them because, they, well, they didn't speak English. They're small in stature, um, the Catholic, you know, and um, and so this was this was a and, and Theodore Roosevelt had a lot to do with it. He he gave speeches constantly for oh, Knights of Columbus and for you know that that these are people who are descendants of Columbus. They're Catholic and. 
Columbus was a Catholic. Right, of course. You, you yeah. know, we have a tradition actually of taking questions on for, for people who are watching. And, mm -hmm. and we have one comment that I want to share first and then the question after that. So the comment is this. One of Roxanne's former students wants to share, quote, I took two Native American studies courses from you in the 1970s when at what was then called Cal State Hayward. You were a tough, fair, straight talking professor who shaped my thinking and values for life. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. I love to have what a wonderful That's student to have. Me. And now that here's another question. Um, do you have any hope for the forthcoming quote, Killers of the Flower Moon filmed in Oklahoma this year? It's an upcoming American Western crime drama directed and produced by Martin Scorsese and written by Eric Roth, written based on the nonfiction book. So I don't know if um, you have any comments on that. Yeah, I didn't read the book, uh, but I think it got a lot of high praise, so. You never know how things translate into a movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, a, you know, it's a true story about the um, horrible corruption of um, the oil kingdom in, yeah. in Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma. Um, it's still, you know, it's still all oil. Everything's about oil. Okay. I, I, I've, I've always had this, this fantasy of, being able to float above Oklahoma and have, you know, like a um, science fiction thing, have those beamed eyes. Right, exactly, like Superman. <laughs> and and I, I would see the entire earth there underneath our oil pipelines, most of them <laughs> leaking. <laughs> yeah, right, right, it's true. But they now have um, earthquakes in Oklahoma. Oh, I know. It's terrible con con um, uh, connection. On the last page of your book, you um, quote Donald Trump, who's criticizing Howard Zinn for, quote, trying to make students ashamed of their own history. And my question is, why is it so hard for Americans to admit they were wrong and to begin to atone for some of these horrible things that it, it's not hard to find out about? you know, how the United States government has treated Native Americans. So, so why are Americans so resistant for taking responsibility, for uh, apologizing, for um, actually, you know, doing something like um, providing some form of reparations for, for peoples who've been displaced? Well, you know, I think um, the lack of knowledge which they don't have, most people don't have much control over, you know, what gets in the textbooks, what gets taught, yeah. um, that they're not getting the real story. So it's very hard, I think, to, to know if you, if you don't have certain pieces, uh, it goes back so far, you know, to the very origins of the yeah. country. But, you know, people do, um, respond and we can tell that with the Black Lives Matter led demonstrations last summer. Yeah. It's massive. I mean in little rural towns in states that, you know, what you call red states, the yeah. Oklahoma, when I saw, you know, this tiny town that I know in Oklahoma that they had um, turned over one of those tanks that the police had. Um yeah. you know, gotten from the military, that surplus military stuff, they turn, turned it over, a group of young people there in that town, little white town. And so I think people do, um, that was evidence, you know, it was short term. Yeah. But it, they responded when that was, that's what I mean by, you know, these mass demonstrations like that, it's a quick learning process that you can't get just out of books. I tried with an indigenous people's history of the United States in this one to provide all these connections, you know, the pieces of the puzzle. Right, right. But I find that people feel liberated by truth. I agree. The truth will set you free. Yeah, rather than yeah. oppressed and saying, oh my God, rather than guilt saying, damn, you know, anger. Like, yeah, exactly. I've been, I've been fooled, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. No one likes to be fooled. So I think it's, you know, a, a lack of knowledge. Uh, Beacon Press is a wonderful press owned by the Unitarians. Yeah, they I know that. Yeah. Things. There's no way a New York publishing house would publish you know, yeah. my books, um, they publish good books, you know, but they don't really, really 
go to the um, crux of the matter. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about. I mean, you've been you're, you you were in, in part of such an important movement in the United States of just the development of ethnic studies in the American universities. And I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about just what are some of the exciting new possibilities that you see in ethnic studies today, and and how has it evolved and changed um, for the better over the years. It's been so important. I feel so honored that I had the opportunity, you know, just being a teaching assistant for um, Ron Takaki, who had this already in mind, even though he's trained in history um, and setting up and, you know, actually uh, working on building a department. I feel privileged because every course I ever taught, I designed myself. Uh, yeah. designed the curriculum not many you know we all did doing yeah. ethnic studies it hadn't been done before and I remember we didn't have many texts I had to teach against the text I would assign text and say now we're going to read this critically yeah. um, and and put things together you know Xerox different things and and make make books literally yeah uh, we all were in that process. And then, of course, good literature started coming out. And so I think it was so important because it has, I mean, now in the Ivy Leagues, uh, history departments are now uh, finally, they're not developing ethnic studies, but they're hiring excellent people, Native American scholars. And, uh, of course, African scholars have been for a while, you know, and in, in the Ivy Leagues. And you know what the Ivy Leagues do, it, it kind of dribbles down to the state universities and to uh, private schools and all. So um, it's taken a long time, the process, but I think without the ethnic, ethnic studies is the base for, for to build upon. And they're thriving still. They're really, these departments, there are a lot of places that have you know, no one wants to study history and English. No, the classics, yeah. Liberal, <laughs> yeah. liberal arts anymore, but they're, you know, they never have problems filling classes in ethnic studies. They're thriving in universities. So yeah. what, what that's doing to other departments is they're introducing more courses that, you know, so it, it affects everything. It's not an isolated thing. And you can get PhD in ethnic studies that are very honorable degrees at all the UC um, yeah. campuses and in, in, you know, in most states, at least in the West, uh, you can get the doctorate in ethnic studies. Yeah, we have the um, the former chair of the, um, the Black Studies Department at Sa um, San Francisco State as part of our congregation. She's just so inspiring. I learned so much from her almost every conversation I have. So you're right. I mean, it, it's a field of knowledge that that it's important for, for us to understand and know about. And, and I think people are, are interested, too. Um, and it was a big fight in San Francisco State. Oh, I know. I, I think of her just being yeah, in such a historic. Leader. Yes, completely. Oh my goodness! I know it's just, yeah, and, and people who who really persevered and had this imagination and dreamed this future were, were able to make something that we're all beneficiaries of now, um, so many years later. Yeah, and every year they celebrated and renew the, you know, teach new students the right. process they went through to uh, to create that. Yeah, that was why I was so glad that we had a few other questions that came in, but I was so glad to see one of your former students was uh, uh, wrote in. It was very, very sweet of that person. Well, but well I, that, I, person, I, that person was there in the beginning when, you know, we had these readers. We created. Yeah, completely. Go she pick was, them up a Kinko's copy machine uh, uh, company. One, one of our <laughs> guinea pigs. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely astonished by how fast the time went. It feels like we've only been talking for five minutes, but yes. an hour. Oh, I wonder just to, to close things up, if you could just um, tell us just some signs of hope that you're seeing on the horizon, just um, some, some things that, are, 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 that you're noticing that, are, that might give us reason for hope for the future. Well, it's pretty hard these days. I know it is, isn't it? <laughs> That's so hard. <laughs> 
Congress in action. I, oh my gosh, yeah. Go I don't know, the, the lack of empathy uh, for that Joe mentioned to say that he's afraid of people getting too many entitlements, this oh. entitled oh, white man, billionaire. Uh, I wanted to slap him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah. I do think that um, I was I was really energized by the demonstrations last year. And I think we have to create that momentum that lasts, yeah. you know, that, that it, it can't be probably that, that uh, uh, I don't know, intense, but a momentum that becomes uh, our daily normal thing, you know, for, to create community because it, it's interesting, the pandemic in some ways has has brought us together, uh, those of us who are progressives, in yeah. ways that um, I think ha has been, you know, we've been able to, I don't know, really gain a lot of um, of ideas and thinking, and and we see on the horizon more pandemics because we have, you know, we have climate catastrophe, which. Oh, Roxanne, you're frozen. I wonder if I'm frozen. <laughs> Roxanne? Oh, well, um, the technology failed us, but I'm so grateful for Roxanne's, um, for Roxanne's comments tonight and for her book. Um, it really is worth reading. If you get a chance to read Not a Nation of Immigrants, I recommend it very highly. Um, please join me next week when my guest will be Bishop Megan Rohr. She's the first um, trans bishop uh, of any major religious denomination in the world. Um, she was consecrated here, or ordained here at Grace Cathedral uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, we rely on your support for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can uh, give on gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 76278, 76278. And thanks again to Roxanne dunbar and for you for joining us at Grace Cathedral on the forum. Good night. <laughs>